Praise the Lord. You know, this morning I just kind of, um, well, for the whole weekend I guess I just kind of been like, you know, wanting to shut the devil down. You know, we just want to shut him down. Because, you know, he, trying to cause habit, you know, we just take the word of God and just shut him down. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to sing this morning this song called War. Because we are in a war. We're in a war with the enemy. He just keeps popping his head up. You know that game pop? pop and he just keeps popping his head up and you have to just keep knocking him down. Praise the Lord. So we're going to give this a shot this morning. Praise the Lord. I should pray for me. I maybe only sang this one at a time. You know, I got my cheat sheet up here, so <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay. He says that laughter is good medicine. He says the joy 
of the Lord is our strength. Don't ever forget that. Uh, God is the one that made happiness. Uh, Satan wants to take it away. And God gave it to you. So keep smiling. Uh, don't be, uh, uh, be uh, grumpy and grumpy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just say, I'm blessed. Amen. And somebody asks you, how you doing? If you're having a bad day, you're still blessed. Amen. So, uh, you know, anyway, uh, I'm so glad that God loves us. And uh, I'm going to read something to you. I always like to have something kind of funny. And I thought this was kind of cute. A young woman uh, teacher was obviously uh, had pretty liberal tendencies. Explained to her class of small children that she was an atheist. She asked her class if, if they are atheists too. Not really knowing what atheism is, but wanting to be like their teacher, their hands exploded in the air like uh, fireworks. There is one exception though. A little girl named Lucy was not going along with the crowd. The teacher asked her why she decided to be different. And she said, because I'm not an atheist. Then asked the teachers, what are you? And she replied, I'm a Christian. Uh -huh. The teacher was a little perturbed now. And her face was a little slightly uh, red. She asked Lucy why she thought she was a Christian. Well, I was brought up knowing and loving Jesus. My mom is a Christian. My dad is a Christian. So I'm a Christian. The teacher now was a little angry. And there was no reason that she says loudly, what if your mom was a moron and your dad was a moron, what would you be? There was a little pause and then a smile. And Lucy replied, I'd be an atheist. <laughs> to serve the Lord. The wonderful day to be in the house of God. A wonderful day to sing God praises. And now we're going to get into the Word of God, and so I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles and stand. We're going to honor the Word. All right, hold it up high. And say it with all of your heart, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living of the Word of God, I will never be the same, never, 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 I will never be the same, in Jesus' name. Alright, thank you, may be seated. Yesterday we had uh, a wonderful funeral for uh, a beautiful lady from our church that uh, she had had some, uh, suffering over the last few years several times that we thought she was going to pass and she responded and came back. Uh, but through it all she kept her uh, eyes on Jesus. She had uh, a heart for prayer. She had a heart for the Word. Uh, I found out from the family that she had uh, uh, she'd been raised uh, a Catholic and, uh, and she had uh, a strong religion. She had to go to uh, Catholic schools and learn her, the catechism and things like that. But she didn't find a, a personal relationship with the Lord until 
uh, years later. And when she was in her mid 30s, she uh, she had some experiences. Uh, Roger, her husband, had uh, uh, talked with her about uh, the Inquisition and uh, the battles that were taking that took place there between the Catholic Church and in the in the Christians, and then uh, and, and began getting her to think about what do I really believe, and then she had an experience where the back seat of a of a car, I think it was a work car, uh, there was a Bible. It was a Gideon Bible, and she found that Gideon Bible, and curiosity, she started to read it. And the family said that by the time she got through seven chapters of Proverbs, she was hooked on the Word of God. And then she began to read it morning, noon, and night every single day and fell in love with God's Word. And she fell in love with Jesus. And uh, the Lord Jesus became the center of her heart. And she then encouraged her family members all of them to read the word. She encouraged them to pray, to talk with God. And uh, every single day when they would go off, she would remind them to pray. And uh, so she was a wonderful, wonderful lady, a character actually. Uh, reminds me of some of the stories I heard about Lucy of all, actually. I love Lucy. Uh, that's kind of the way she was. She had a sparkling, spontaneous personality, and she could not meet a stranger. Everybody she met was uh, somebody that she loved and fell in love with and instantly became a friend to. And uh, she, there were lots of great stories about, uh, about her that, that came out during the service. In talking with the family, I had... Uh, uh, and and I, I got a chance to listen for a little bit. They were telling stories of when uh, they went up and down California. And uh, uh, one of the things that to me was such a funny story was when uh, she uh, went into a, it was a uh, kind of like a, a campground area. Because she needed to use the bathroom really bad, but she didn't come out. And they wondered, where in the world is she? And finally they had to send somebody in because their daughter was about to die. She needed to go into the bathroom and the guys couldn't take her in. And so they went in there and there she had a whole group of women she had cornered there in the middle and they were all trading recipes. <laughs> Who could do that? But she could do it. Uh, one time uh, when she was down, they were down uh, at one of the big golf tournaments. Uh, one of the famous ones, and uh, they were there on the, you know, at the golf course, all of the celebrities and special people wore a blue ribbon. The uh, spectators got a red ribbon. Well, lo and behold, they were looking for her, and then they spotted her, and somehow she had managed to get a blue ribbon. Somebody gave her a blue ribbon because they, her personality was so spectacular that they figured she had to be someone of of uh, notoriety, and so they gave her ribbons. <laughs> she became friends to everybody, all the stars and all the people that were there. And uh, so eventually she made uh, friends with uh, uh, a lot, the, all the stars of the day. Merv Griffin became one of her really close friends. Stars would come and stop and stay at their house when they were in between towns. But the point I want to make is, she learned the scripture well. If you want to have friends, be friendly. And she was the kind of person that never met a stranger. She never allowed a person that had a need to go without helping them. And she became a blessing. And she became a friend. And many, many people came to celebrate her life. Uh, yesterday. She was ready is what I'm trying to say. She had her ticket punched. She had her reservation set. 
She was ready to meet her personal friend Jesus in heaven. What a neat service we had for her. As a pastor over the years, I've had to do services where the person didn't know the Lord. The person wasn't ready to go home to God. The person was not a Christian. Those are the hard ones. Because to be honest with you, what do you say? At best, you can recite some of the events of their life and what their hobbies were and how much they like to fish or how much they like to hunt or how much they like to camp. But when it really comes down to it, it's hard to say something. It's hard to give the family comfort because the family members know they were not ready to meet the Lord. Think about that. And I ask you as I get ready to read a scripture, how ready are you if the Lord would call you home today and he just might? I couldn't believe it this past week when my dear friend Steve Terry passed away. I, just, I couldn't believe it. Steve Terry was full of energy, full of life, involved in ministry. He was the head of the Orville Rescue Mission. He was a firefighter took water to all the fires. He was the chaplain of the sheriff's department up in Orville in that area of Butte County. He uh, drove our bus to senior trips. He came down every Christmas during the drive through and brought a group to work from uh, Orville Rescue Mission in our drive through and he drove a bus through over 15 minutes so the people that didn't want to sit in their cars and wait could just kept walk up and go through, or the, the ones in, that were in the, uh, in the show that were actors and were part of the play itself could go through. I was shocked when she passed away. And he's going to be missed. But one thing I can tell you about Steve, he loved Jesus. He was ready to meet the Lord. He had a lot of work he wanted to do down here, but he was ready to go home if the Lord called him. And the Lord called him home. In the scripture in the book of Luke, there is a passage I'd like to read to you. Luke chapter 12 and I'd like for you to look down at verse 13. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. I'll give you a chance to get there. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning with verse number 13. The scripture reads this way. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable. The ground of a certain man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger barns. 
And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This is the very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be when anyone stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we come to you today thankful people. We're thankful, Lord, because you loved us and you cared about us and you paid the price of the cross for us. We're thankful that we can take communion today and we can rejoice in the fact that we know you. Lord, it is our prayer as we read this scripture that you will make it come alive, that you will speak to our hearts, that you will share something that will touch us at the innermost level. Bless the reading of the Word. Teach us from the Word. May we leave out of here today saying, it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. The Word of God spoke to me. Teach us an important lesson today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was teaching people eternal things about God. Jesus had come down from heaven with one purpose in mind. To try to get the attention of us mortals and make us realize that we need to prepare to go to heaven. Heaven was created for us. Hell was not. Hell was created for Satan and all the imps and demons that serve him. That was created for them and it says it will be a terrible place. It will be a place of fire, eternal fire. It will be a place of eternal death. We will not die. We will be separated from God. That is the most horrible thing about hell is the separation from God who we were created to be with. Hell separates us from God. We are eternally apart from God. And we are in a horrible fire that burns with anguish. The Bible even says, where the worms dieth not. I guess that means Johnny Worm. But uh, he's probably been told that his whole life. But uh, hell is a terrible place you don't want to go. There are a lot of people that say, no, I don't believe in hell. I believe that when you die, that's the end. Or I believe if you're not a Christian, you simply, it's, uh, it's, you, you just, it's the end for you. No, not according to the Scripture. It's a place you do not want to go. It's a place that was not created for you. It's a place you go if you don't know the Lord. The Scripture says that Jesus told them that there was a person there when He was teaching, when He was speaking, and He had been speaking to a lot of, uh, a lot of people. It says in the verses before that uh, they had brought uh, before the synagogue rulers, authorities, uh, and they, they, they had come out and they were being taught by Jesus Christ. This guy interrupts the teachings of Jesus, interrupts what Jesus was sharing to ask him this question. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now stop and think about this. You have the audacity to come into a place where the Lord Jesus is teaching. He has maybe three and a half years to share everything that we need to know of how to get from earth to heaven. 
And he's interrupted by somebody who wants him to come in and act as an arbiter to get his brother to give him his share of the inheritance. He wasn't listening to Jesus. He didn't care about what Jesus was teaching and what he was telling. All he was concerned about was getting what belonged to him. He wanted his stuff. He wanted his things. I cannot tell you how many times in my ministry that I have had people come by and demand my time right there on the spot for matters just like this. I need you to do something. My husband isn't, we're, we're divorced, but he didn't give me my share. My family members didn't give me my part of the inheritance. I've had these matters come up all the time. And they, they're, they demand it's the most important thing to them. Stuff and things and money is what they care about. Jesus took this example and took this time to share this with us. He first of all told the man, he said, look, I'm not going to be your judge and I'm not going to be your arbiter. That is not what I came to do. Jesus knew that he came for one purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to show us how we could prepare so we could go to heaven. That's what Jesus came to do. And so he tells this parable to this man, and I'm sure the others that were listening. Here's what the parable was, very simple. He said, I'm, he said there was a rich man, farmer, he happened to be a farmer, and this man that was very wealthy, very rich, had a big farm. We don't know how big it was, it's not really important, except that he had a lot of of employees, he owned a lot of ground, he had a lot of barns, and he was raising a lot of crops. Back there he may have been raising wheat, we don't know. It doesn't make any difference. Except that he ended up having some really good years where you really raise a lot and you, you make a lot of money. Some years you don't make a lot of money. But he had some good years into where when he got his crops and he got them in, he had so much that he couldn't even get them into the buildings that he had. And here's what he said. I've got so much. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones. What he had in his mind was that not only was he going to have this big crop, but he's going to have big crops from, from, for years to come. He is blessed. Look what I have done. This is what we do. Look what I have done. Look at what I have built. Look at what I have raised. Success is measured by how much stuff we have or how many things we have or how many homes we have or how much land we have or how big our business is or how many employees we have. That is how we determine success. God looks at success in a different way. God looks at success in how close you are to Him. How close you are to God and how close God is to you. What kind of fellowship you have with the Lord. How many prayers you offer in faith that God answers. That's success. But this man's success was based on his farming business. And so he had some great years, and he raised a lot of crops, which were worth a lot of money. And so he said, I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to hire more employees. I'm going to grow, grow more crops. And he said, I'm going to sit back myself and watch it happen. And he said, I'm going to build bigger barns. 
And he said, I'm going to have this philosophy. I'm going to eat and drink and be merry because of my money. And God made a statement. I hope God never says this of you. He looked at the man and he called him a fool. He said, you are a fool. Tonight, this very night, you're going to die. Your soul is going to be demanded by God. God's going to call you home. Yes, a tough thing. When you lose someone, it's hard. We have a great program called Grief Share. I tell you, if you lose someone that's close to you, as soon as you're able to deal with it, you need to get involved in grief share. They've taken 13 things that everyone will experience as they go through grief. And each week they take one of those items and they share it and then they talk about it. Now some will have nerve endings that are so raw they won't talk, they'll listen. But you begin to process all the things that you're going through. You begin to find out that you're not the only one that's going through it, but it's common to men and to women to go through all of these things. And they give you tools and handles of how to deal with it. Because death is final. Death is at the end. And you have to learn to deal with it. So when you lose someone, you have some tough days. But it's worse when you are like this man who was a fool because he had not prepared to meet his God. He had not prepared for death. His philosophy was eat, drink, and be merry. God said, you are a fool because tonight you're going to die. One thing about death, we cannot prepare for. We, we think we can. Doctors sometimes will tell us, uh, you've got so much time before you're going to die. But the truth of the matter is, God numbers our days. This man was referred to as a fool by God because he had not prepared to meet his God when he died. This very night, your life is going to be demanded of you. Then, who will get all the stuff that you have? You ever think about that? Who's going to get this stuff when you? You're the government probably will get most of it. Or your kids will fight over it, or your family will fight over it. But I can tell you something. You will not take it to heaven. Billy Graham once said, you will never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. When you go to heaven, what you have is what you sent on before you. The scripture says it in two different ways. One is where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. But it says in a different way. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Both ways. When you fall in love with Jesus, stuff and things are not as important. And you begin to store <coughs> treasures. I call it the bank of heaven. You store treasures in the bank of heaven where moths and rust and rust will not come, and thieves will not come and steal it. It'll last forever. On the judgment day, it's going to be a sad day to see billionaires and hundreds of billions of dollar heirs, and I guess whatever else the next number is, who didn't think about the Lord 
stand before God begging like a beggar, beggar in the street for mercy. And they can't buy it. They can't pay for it. That's sad. And God basically will look at them and say, you're a fool. You put your, your trust in stuff and things. Now, I'm not saying it's not good to have money. I'm, I'm not saying that, that you should not have money. It doesn't say in the Bible that money is the root of all evils, but it is one of the roots of all evils, it says. If you have your faith in money, uh, and that is your God, you're in big trouble because that isn't God. There is an eternal God that created the heavens and the earth and everything that's made belongs to Him. And He created us in His image. And He wants us to come to heaven, but we can only come because of our sins if we make our peace with Christ. If you're here today and you have not made that peace with Christ, He's already done the hard part. He went to a rugged cross. He shed his blood on the cross. His body was broken. He was buried in a tomb that was a borrowed tomb. And the stone could not hold him in. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And he had victory over death and hell. He is life. To know Christ is to have life. To know Christ is to have an account in the bank of heaven where you can store what's important to you and the things that are important to you will be the relationship you have with God. And it will last for eternity. How long is eternity? It's a long time. This life, if you're lucky enough to live 80 or 90 years, is that long compared to eternity. How long is eternity? It has no end. It will be forever. People ask me, how old will you be in heaven? What difference does it make how old you are when you're in heaven? You have, no, you have no age. Because heaven lasts forever. And so don't worry about it. I guarantee you it says you're not going to grow old. It says you're not going to get sick. It says that you're not going to have pain or sorrow. It says that you're going to be in the presence of God forever. So what difference does it make how old you are? I think you're going to be the perfect age when you're in heaven. But I just don't know what the perfect age is, but uh, I think you're going to be the perfect age. So he called this man a fool because the man had put his faith in stuff and things and his heart was focused on those things and he was not ready to meet God. This is how it will be for anyone, the scripture says, who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. <coughs> Today, we have a lot of wealthy people in this church. People that have come to a point in their life where they have acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God and have invited Jesus into their heart and have been changed for eternity. They are now wealthy. They'll be joint heirs with Jesus. How wealthy is that? Well, every single thing that's been created and every planet throughout the entire universe of which there are billions and billions and billions of them, all that gold, all that silver, all that plutonium, all of that uh, oil, all that natural gas, and you can go down the, down the line, it all belongs to God, and you are a joint heir. If you're looking at stuff and things, you're going to be taken care of forever. So you are rich in the things of God. There may be some of the church here that are rich in stuff and things, but they have not made their peace with God. And this thing is just not going to stay on there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Keep the dreaming on 
We're going to, uh, to sing a song today. I'm going to ask Randy if he would come up and, and uh, lead us in a song. I'm going to have you all to stand. I'm going to ask you all to just bow your heads for a moment. Just for a second. No one looking around. I just want you to think for a minute. Am I a rich person? By that I mean, do I know the Lord? You may be here today and you desperately need simply to pray that prayer where you ask God to forgive you. Because we've all messed up. We've all done things that are wrong. That makes us a sinner. Which will keep us from heaven. Maybe you're here today and you just have never prayed that prayer where you just simply pause and say, Lord, forgive me. And Lord, I want to fall in love with you. I want to live for you. I want to be a Christian. And because of that, I'll get to go to heaven. There are some here today that simply need to come to the Lord and pray a simple prayer and invite Him into their heart. You may want to come to an altar and let someone pray with you. You may want to come up and talk to one of our prayer partners and just invite the Lord into your heart. So that when it, God calls you home, whenever it is, it could be today, it could be next month, it could be ten years from now, but whenever it is, you will be ready. Lord, I just pray that you will speak to people's hearts and meet people's needs, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Remember this last verse we sing today. Allow God to do a work in your heart.